if you've logged in, it's because you're interested in learning more about the editing process. So let's go ahead and spruce up this rough draft. Uh, one of the things you'll notice these paragraphs, I like to justify the margins and I do it one section at a time because if I try to do the whole thing, it's just going to be a mess. So I've had too much experience with that and I just take one paragraph and then I go up here, I highlight it, I go up here and I hit, hit that, and that justifies the margins. Then I have to just sort of look uh, <clears throat> for these kinds of problems. Then I'm going to read the content out loud, and the, remember the abstract is one paragraph, and so this follows that formula, six-stage formula. And now we come down to the introduction. And in MLA, it says to put a period after. So I want to make a point about this to y'all. If you are writing a, a paper for a dissertation or for a master's thesis, you will have a committee who is determining how you structure your essay. MLA has some guidelines, but MLA is not the be-all end-all of the world. There is a specific way of documenting resources and citing resources, but at the end of the day, you will have somebody who is indicating to you the format that's acceptable for them. If it's for a journal, if it's for an anthology, there will be some of those regulations. So, in the meantime, do it the way you want to do it, and then you can always modify it later. That is not what is what we're doing, and we're not even going to bold it. So I'm going to do this within reason, because this is what it says in MLA to do, is to just put the... I have a large section title because I like sections, as I've said. I think that, again, I'm, I am for my reader. I want my reader to never be confused and to always know where they are in the narrative. And so... Uh, then I read the content out loud. Like my flower power friends, I want to mention the new years I've heard where I could make a difference in certain signs of the times, you know, being part of the young people. And this is how I do it. I just mumble like that, but I'm reading everything out loud, and that helps me hear punctuation. And then I can hear some sentences that don't necessarily make sense. Okay. As I mentioned before, and I this is the only place in the essay, other than the ending little poem, that I indent any extended content. I don't like it. My reader is going to have to take their focus from these margins and center here, which in this case is a good thing because I want them to see this poignant Sign of the Times lyric. The other folk festivals. All right. Uh, festivals were popular. I, I just said festivals. So that's redundant. You see folk festivals. Uh, let me try to find a better word. I'll be right back. That was quick. Open air music events were popular all over the... in the 60s. See figure one. I don't think I'm going to do that. That's that wow factor chart that I have. Open air venue. Oh, I just said it. Two venues. Outdoor. So this is the power of music. And fine fellowship, the phenomenal Woodstock Festival, like standard, created to entertain 50,000 people. It's been totally. Yes. A young man in a little swing, observed science, and I still, I never did find out who this young man is. I'll make one more stab at finding out who he is, and then I'll have to give it up. Because I have him. This is what we do. And the citations for. Film and video information that you have quotes. I there are so many Woodstock movies. There's Woodstock 
there and back, Woodstock, there are so many Woodstock movies that if I put that citation in every time I have a quote, that citation is going to be three lines of, even if I shorten it. So what I did is I put the director, and then I have the time stamp where the quote comes from, and I'm leaving it at that. So um, somebody would have to tell me if that's, if my committee chairman or whatever would have to say, no, you have to do it this way. But I don't want my reader to have to stop reading to read some mile-long citation. So I've gotten enough. All they have to do is go to Wadley and they see where the film is. So, again, we have too many films for that. So, many lost of that leader. Needed to guide them. Was. So here's what I'm going to do. All of this is in the past tense. So I'm just going to go check up here real quick. And I'm going to find... I'm not going to find and replace. I just want to find any place in the essay where I have the word is. And then I know to change it. Too many results to show here. Oh, well, let's go put is everywhere. So let's try it like this. I'll be right back. Okay, I didn't find any, but I'm still going to look as I go. Look out for that because I have I've decided to put this all in the past tense, which means it all has to be in the past tense. No, I'm trying to do that. The pen's on. So it's a potential theory, and that's that's what I'm doing. I'm a potential theory here that attempts to explain the earth and spiritual elements. Your mind creating songs. Stand for the chipping point. Well, it is a book. It's not was a book, so that I have to. Okay, I can fix this. The tipping point. Voila, a book by Teda got away with it got it out of there a book by Matthew Williams explains there that's how I got around that right you can always avoid it so that it doesn't look like I don't want my reader confused are we in the past tense where are we how small I should be in the right place the right road to the trend trend Okay. Uh, what I did too is there were places where I had stickiness factor not capitalized and capitalized. So I fixed that a while back in making all of these capitalized. Now I'm going to do a little bit more and I'll come back in whenever I get to something that's important or poignant for you to see. Regardless of what essay you're writing, whether you're evaluating, uh, resources for Alzheimer's, whether you're postulating a theory for the violence of Hitler, whether you're evaluating how one would apply biblical practices or, or stories to today. Whatever you're doing, the second section of your essay is always going to be the world of the story. Where is this happening? Where are we? The reader cannot fill that in for you. So everybody wants to make sure that that second section and that you can find more about that in that outlining in the left menu bar. But this is always going to have to happen. Defining terms, the context. So the fact that the power of context is one of Malcolm Gladwell's theory is fine. It would be that anyway. So I'm building up to where the sign of the time, what was the, what was the, the, festival idea. And look at this. I'm just way too much here. Festivals, festivals. See how redundant that is? And then festivals again. So I think I've said festivals. And here too. Look at this. I've got to fix this. I'll be right back and I'll show you how I did that. Okay, so I just simply left that one. And then I called them music events. And then I said as crowd sizes began to escalate, larger concert venues were booked. So, one of the nice things about editing is finding those little pockets where I repeated the same word over and over again. And it does me no good to shame myself for that. It just is what it is, and I pause a minute and just fix it. So that's what happens. This to let you see that every single person is redundant.
And so let's move on. I'll, call, I'll be back when I see something interesting. This is a really yummy image. And I'm going to, I put it here in the sign of the times in the power of the context because I've mentioned outside festivals, open air festivals, and all the ways that we could say that. And this picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, it is the location that is building the stage. They had like 10 minutes to get that stage built. So this is interesting. But what I want to show you is how to manipulate an image. Now I've chosen to uh, frame all of my images the same. And so I uh, decided on this, this one here. And so all my images are framed the same. Now, what I want to be able to do is not get too far because I've, I've got them all at just about two inches, but sometimes they're going to have to be just a little bit bigger. And if there's writing, some of the images have writing. So you can play around with this to make sure that the information over here doesn't have huge gaps. I mean, that's a forgivable gap. But if I get too far over here, it just it goes off the, you know, so you just tag them and play around with them until you get them set and then let them go. Let's see what happens if I come back there. Here, that works. All right. Ah. And again, if I, if I may need to make it a little bit bigger, see if I make it just a little bit bigger, see how that works? Very nice. Okay, moving on. I'll be back. We're still in that section of the power of context. Uh, again, for you, that will be section two of whatever it is that you're writing about, the section where you explain what your terms mean, what the world is, and so forth. This is a transition sentence. While the four producers dreamed and planned and looked upon Max, Max Jasker's farm, the rest of the world was upside down. That means that the next several paragraphs that come will be discussing the world as upside down. So we're going to start with this tour of the Vietnam area now era. Now you might wonder why, but the point important thing is that we cannot I don't want to get too far away from this graph, which is I you know, trying to figure out where to put this awesome graph has been challenging. And it still is because it's on page six that we have the wow factor. So prior to this, we've just been throwing out numbers and showing them this is and that's. And now here comes the big wow factor that shows just how this festival stands far and above apart from all of the others. Okay, so I'm still leaving it there because all right, so we're going to be, we're building up to that with this information about the war and such. So I don't want to build it up so much that my reader forgets what we're talking about, which is Woodstock. And so there may be some editing that still needs to be done in here uh, to, but we want to bring home the fact that people were terrified by this point. And some were not, and, and I don't want to get away from the fact that some people enlisted in the army because that's exactly what they wanted to do and that's there's no problem with that so but it was the idea of a forced draft that I want to uh, focus on so I'll be back I'll find something more interesting I'll bring be back okay so I, I cut down the Vietnam War to two paragraphs and this was the escalation so the first is this was when Another point where the world just completely went upside down because everything was given back in redacted statements and this was something that was... Uh, okay, see this is the Woodstock documentary that's by Goodman and that's why I've separated these because just to make the citations uh, shorter, but still we have the timestamps. Okay, I'll be back. I want to mention two things. First, I am never going to copy an image of the book title and put it in an essay. There is no reason to show a book cover when I'm listing the title. The book cover has nothing to do with the essay I'm writing and I never do that. Now the second thing is I'm not sure this paragraph fits. 
I was looking back over at my outline and I don't see we're going from we're going from the war all these things got messed around so every time you move something I swear something else happens so we're supposed to go from here to the okay that's Vietnam we're supposed to go from here to the assassinations so I, this is why the outline is so wonderful. Somehow everything got out of kilter. So I'm going to fix this and I'll be back. And this is the end of that information about Vietnam. And I make sure that while some young men enlisted to have more options against the inevitable, most of the people I knew were horrified. So I can't say, I don't need to say how many most of the people were. Like I can't say 85% of the people there's no way to get that statistic. How many people were frightened? You can't. I, there, I don't see any way to to evaluate that. So I always come back to me. The people I knew were horrified. That way, I'm not making any claim that would say every kid in the United States or every kid in the world. I'm just saying people I knew, and that that kind of always helps me avoid that pitfall. And then this is the three. Three events that uh, impacted the caravan. Just a little bit bigger. Filling that gap there. There we go. Shall we lose that sound? Whoops. And that paragraph that I had found that was out of place, because this is Monterey, this is. The, how, it, how the word got to California because we've just indicated that people came but we want to show the expanse of where people came I'll be right back okay so this was uh, showing and again in the context is the limited availability of uh, methods of communication and then we go from there to the everybody that I mentioned above and everybody's going to lead us up to this chart, this graph. And so I describe the chart before the reader sees the chart. Sometimes I might show the chart, I mean the, the explanation after or to the right of a chart or point out whatever I want the reader to see from there. But this is a big chart. It's sort of the wow moment of the essay, and hopefully it brings that power of context to a moment where people really see exactly what was going on here. Okay. And remember, if I create a chart myself, under here explains where I got the information. So I didn't just come up with these numbers nilly-willy. I came up with them from Omni.com who researched and uh, found those numbers. All right, so that's the chart, the graph. I'm going to leave it there. It's at the top of the page. Okay, I'm going to see what this is about. I'll be right back. I thought that was kind of a neat deal. Before the graph, I explained where the uh, statistics came from. Then I show the graph, and then I talk about Woodstock. So we have an explanation of how the information was gathered, the wow factor, and now this is a continuation of that paragraph. We're not through with that paragraph. The paragraph is talking about this, or discussing this graph. All right, so, and this time there's no, there's no director for Woodstock. And back again, it's a YouTube thing. So, you know, there you go. But see, you see how long it makes the citation. You're on my side. I know you are. In other words, graph does not show how many people who knew about the festivals talk about the festival or pass the word about the events. Who knew about? Let's just do it like this. I'm going to fix this. I'll show you what I did. Let me just do it while you're here. Okay. Knew about. We're going to trim this sentence up. Who knew about? Comma. Talked about. Past word about it's 
These festivals. See, I, I trimmed that down so that it's not festivals, festivals, festivals. And it just makes that a nice, neat, compact sentence. And all from reading it out loud. The graph does not show an accounting of people who knew about, talked about, passed word about these festivals. Or, there we go. Nice. Nice sentence. Is there any of the formula people who are, see why I do this, at, I do this editing this way because I won't have to do it again. The next time we're going to add the title page, we're going to add the works cited, and we're going to polish, and I won't have to go back and do all of this fine tuning. I only do it once because I do it nice and slow. Go through this and edit. Okay. And this. Okay. This. Oh, I don't know where you guys go, but. Okay, so this is the assassinations. This is where that picture goes. So it goes down here like this. Put it on top of that page. Nice. All right. Got a big gap here we gotta fix. Okay. Beyond the word, reading the Okay. So this is how we've done this little nice little section on the power of context. And the power of context in this particular instance is going to be longer than it might be in an essay that you are writing. It depends on what you're writing about. Um, this has this is a sociological essay. So sociology means the world of it. So okay, I'm gonna do a couple things. I'll be right back. Okay, and this is the end of that section. That is the Con power of context beyond the word reaching the masses in an era of horror and death the context of Woodstock was ripe for popularity despite problematic events at other festivals the mid-August date just weeks before the start of school the mid-August date just before the start of school comma and the changing location comma hippies persisted in their quest with a votive purpose with a charged atmosphere, wait, what's all this with? Okay, this transition sentence is leading to a new section. So I'm going to indicate what the next section is going to include in the sections thereafter. A charged national atmosphere. Frustrated flower children, an avalanche of music, and an active drug culture made the country ready for additional for the additional tipping point factors, the law of the few, the connectors, and the stickiness factor. All right. That's good. That's good. Okay. Now we have the law of the few, and the law of the few is broken down into the mavens. Let's look over at the, at the uh, outline real quick. Okay. So the law of the few. Got the little Gladwell quote. A, the Mavens, Michael Lang, Artie Cornfield. The connectors who know everyone. Salespeople get the money for the project. John Roberts, Joel Rosenman. The Sound and Light guys. Stage MCs, Chipmunk and John Morris. And Security Wavy Gravy. That's what's going to be in this section. The Law of the Few. And see how it looks in the actual essay. Super fun, huh? There it is, the law of the few in the section. And over here we have the mavens. To be, I'm not going to, uh, they want to, the, MLA says put a period there. I guess I will. All right. So, now I'm going to just look at this introduction and I'll be right back. But as you can see, for this purposes of essay, visionary and maven are put together. Uh, Gladwell indicates that mavens have everybody's best intentions. They are also the visionaries. And they're represented by three of the forces that made Woodstock an iconic event. Michael Lang, Dale Bell, the producer of Woodstock, and Michael Wadley, the director of Woodstock. And then this is how I connect that with the visionary. Starts with a clean sheet of paper. Reimagines the word, though credit is claimed for many of the victories and blamed for the mistakes of Woodstock. There is no disputing the fact that Michael Lang was the brainchild of the event. And that's where we go and start that that 
former part was an introduction. So here we have Michael Lang, and he's with Max Yasker. Okay, I'm going to check on this. I'll be back. Okay, so for Michael Lang, this is the introductory paragraph. And this explains, of course, he's not a choir boy, he wasn't, but he is, he has these intentions. So this describes his intentions. Okay, so the kind of tricky thing here is that Michael Lang is the visionary. It's his idea and the whole point of for him to move up to Woodstock area. But, and Artie is not a maven. Artie is a connector who had a job at Capitol Records and had connections to a number of people. So that is why we have this transition. Michael Lane was a visionary behind the project. His first contact was connector Artie Cornfield, who worked at Capitol Records because the mavens I discovered, and I've already corrected the outline. Let's look at that outline. The visionaries are not just Michael Lang, but also the movie makers, Dale Bell, who produced the movie, and Michael Wadley, who was the director. So that's why we have these three people under the mavens, the visionaries. And I've used the information in the tipping point to show that mavens also means visionaries. They have the visionary. They want to share it with everybody. They're enthusiastic. And then the first connector is Artie Cornfield. So let's go back over to the essay and we'll see where Artie is setting up the deal with the film. Okay, so Artie sent word around that Woodstock was going to be an epic event for 50,000 fans. And that when he did that, producer Dale Bell listened and made a decision to enlist the services of a young cinematographer named Michael Wadley to check out the venue. It was Dale Bell who drove up to Sullivan County. Now we see this little paragraph here, and so we're just going to go ahead and justify these margins and wonder why this paragraph is so short. So, was the paragraph before too long? <laughs> Okay. Michael Lang's vision does include Yasger, but that's sort of the practical idea of what you know the festival was supposed to be a different location and they had to change it very quickly before the I'm not sure this goes there. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm going to leave that because Yasker's Farm is part of the vision, and I don't really talk about it very much in the rest of the essay because we're talking about how it happened, which Yasker is a part of. But uh, okay, was well, so he had no idea what the f documentary would do to the festival, so we're going to move this. That's the transition sentence, and so we're going to move that there. Okay. So now we're talking about the documentary. Okay, and Artie does his talk around town, Capitol Records. And da, 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 da. when Artie sent where like that, da, 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 da. made a decision. Okay, good, good, good. That's done. All right, moving on. What does this have to do? with the movie. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm justifying why they're mavens, why the filmmakers are mavens. Oh, lost myself right there. Pastoral scenes today is to come. So now we're talking about the pastoral scene. Okay. Why would those people insist upon traffic jams in order to reach the promised land? I have two from someone will come with fire to a Volkswagen. And see when it does this kind well, let's just try to justify those margins. Oh, it's not bad. Uh, Chief Rensselaer Farm, Volkswagen. We knew something special was happening there. We knew they were making a movie. Kendrick interview. I asked how in the world anybody in the Southwest knew about a film crew. Kendrick paused and said, I don't know, we just knew. The attraction of an event that promised something special and was even being filmed no doubt motivated other teams who insisted upon the fruitless journey. 
The film project would not have been possible without the visions, and again, Maven's visions, of producer Dale Bell and first time director Michael Arsazzo. Shown below. Okay. Way there he is. It's a nice director picture, isn't it? Oh, so easy to find. Some of them aren't. <clears throat> Why would producer Dale Bell hire a novice? Okay, sometimes a transition sentence that's a question is a nice connector for a reader. I don't want it to be everywhere in the essay, but sometimes when information is coming that's kind of dry or, or I don't want the reader to start getting confused and wonder where they are in the narrative, in the expo exposition, then a question is okay. Again, if I was writing this as a master's thesis, I bet you $100 that my committee chair would have something to say about ending a paragraph with a transition sentence that's a question. I'm going to do it because it's a sociological essay. It's not a scientific essay, so I'm leaving it in there. But, you know, you've got, always got to be willing to change if you're writing it for some publication or for a master's thesis or something. Bell's stated objective was that as a social justice, as a social, okay, I'll be right back. I'm going to check this out. Okay, so this paragraph uh, explains why Dale Bell hired Michael Wadley and makes it clear that this is the Friday before the festival. I don't know if you've seen the movie Woodstock, but it's quite a documentary, one that Academy Award, it's an incredible documentary, and they started a week before the festival. What? And so they hastily, so this is like the practicals. We have this vision. If we shoot it, we will own it. In other words, if they make the movie, they'll own it. And they make a hasty strategy, 70 cameras, stitch cameramen, editors, and film stock. And I add this young Martin Scorsese is an interesting thing for the reader. It has nothing really to do with the vision, but um, you know, John Kelly, part of the man new management team at Warner Brothers, decided, agreed to cover the cost of 15000 or as he put it, at lunch in Vegas. Filming an iconic documentary was a terrific plan, but for the fact that between them, they had $10,000. How many of the 4 million people who went or tried to go to the festival went because the movie was happening? That number is impossible to calculate. The fact remains that over 16... See, I'm justifying... Uh, because the film was shown after the festival. And that's the opposition that I'm anticipating by justifying these two guys and their crew as part of the Maven team, the visionaries. Because somebody would say, well, you know, that doesn't count because they came after the film. I mean, after the festival was over and kind of glorified it in a little bit of a way. They didn't show the lawsuits afterwards or anything like that, but we don't care. That's not part of the this essay. So that's kind of why I'm saying that. The fact remains that over $16 million, okay, because a movie was happening, that number is impossible to calculate. There, I've got another question. I know you're thinking, we just did a question transition. Should we do a question here? If I don't, I'm just going to have to write all this stuff in a long... All right, I'm going to fix it. I know you're saying two questions in a row sounds bad. I'll be back. Okay, the number of people who went or tried to go to the festival is impossible to calculate. The fact remains that over $16 million were made in the U.S. alone, and an estimated 46 million people have watched the film since its release. What, did the, what the movie did and continues to do is distill the Woodstock experience and, more important, keep it vibrant and alive. That's why we put Scorsese in there, because he has this neat, neat, little quote there. Good. No discussion of the mavens of Woodstock would be complete without the anthropologists and stripes of the festival. Woodstock could never come together without connectors Artie Kornfeld, John Roberts, Chris Langhart, Joe Rosamond, and John Morris. I really like this picture of Artie Kornfeld and um, Michael Lang in conversation. This is during the rainstorm. This is while the thunderstorm is happening. And there, I just, I like that. I like the young connection there. All right. 
Back in a minute. Okay, so you can see that this paragraph is talking. We're introducing Artie Kornfeld, who's, of course, key and critical to the whole thing. But see this big, huge gap here? This is what I mean by playing around with the image and maybe even making the image a little bit bigger. And you just play around with it until the justification of margins is all right, making sure the image isn't too big, but so that you don't lose all this stuff. I'll be right back. Okay, so I fiddled with it all I could, but this formatting is just not happy with me. So I'm just going to take this, and I'm just going to take it out of the justification. So I'm going to take that line, and I'm just going to do this, and look, makes it all nice. And nobody's going to care that it doesn't justify right at that particular point. See? Nice. Okay. I'll be right back. While I was doing that, I realized that all this paragraph that's supposed to be two paragraphs is all lumped together, and look how long that paragraph is. This is what I mean when I say it's a long, long run-on paragraph. The, can, the paragraph should start here, because we're talking about the partners. Artie is the first, okay, and now we're mentioning the partners. And this is going to go into the detail of the partner, which makes me wonder if the picture is in the right place. So I'm going to look through this and put the picture in the right picture below. See, whenever you, anytime I do an edit, it just moves all these pictures around. It's just, just that's why it's so, feels so good when you make it into a PDF. Okay. All right. I'll be right back. I want to make sure that this entire section of connectors shows how each piece of the picture connects with the next piece of the picture. So uh, I added this, already found John Roberts and Joel Ro Rosenman, who also included the Dream Team. Okay, now we're talking about Artie, and then Artie connects. The four men connect with stage managers and MCs. John Morris and Chipmunk. These two young men connected with Chris Langhart on the ground technician and creator Woodstock Bridge and Bill Hanley, sound designer. The final connective force of the festival was Wavy Gravy and the unlikely security heroes of from the hog farm commune. Because I don't want my reader to not know what that is. Okay, so what? I'll be right back. Okay, I have to, I went back to the outline, which always is very helpful. So we have the description of what the connector is. And then we have how Michael Lang, the visionary Mavel, Maven, made his first connection with Artie Kornfeld. And then Already found John Roberts and Joel Roseman, Roseman, and then they connected with the MCs John Morris and Chip Monk, and those two men connected to Chris Langhart on the ground technician and creator of the Woodstock Bridge, and Bill Hanley, the sound designer. The final connective force of the festival was the Wavy Gravy and the unlikely security heroes from the Fog, Hog, Hog Farm Commune. Now, good. So that was the kind of the introductory two paragraphs to this section. So now we go with Artie. Tell us about Artie. All right, I'll be right back. Okay, so we have two paragraphs about Artie and his contribution to this, uh, the law of the few. And two nice little short paragraphs. Okay, I've already said this. I know I've already said this. Let me check and make sure. When I see something, I'm not sure if I've already done it. I always just highlight it real quick so I can get back to it, and then I go see if I said that already somewhere else. Okay, I did already say this. I'm going to take this out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it over in my leftovers, which is this little file here. And I'm just going to put it right there in case I need it later. But it's restating something I've already said. They already know about, my reader already knows about the movie. He already knows that it's an incentive and that it's going to happen. Four days before, we're the most talking about. 
Okay, so we're just going to take that out and we'll start here. Okay, so because we're going from Kornfeld to the other two. So we didn't need that, all that information about the film to transition from Kornfeld, who connected with John Roberts and Joel Rosenman. So that's good. All right, good. I'll be right back. Okay, that ends the section on uh, Artie. So now we're going to come down to this uh, John and Joel team, who were the money makers who had a nice vision, but they were the ones that had to make stuff happen. So this is the part that, remember, I indicated I'm a little bit worried that I might have overwritten. So I'm going to check this out. I'll be back. This part's kind of interesting because the um, Lang and Kornfeld didn't come to them with the idea of a concert. They came asking for money to build a sound studio in Woodstock. So what they noticed was an opening day party. And then, so they, the two of them said, why don't we have a music festival? And that kind of one thing led to another. And, and then right after that was when it was clear that there weren't, there wasn't going to be any profit from this Woodstock venture. But they moved forward, and that's the important thing. And Carousel, the young investors believed in the concept more than they desired to turn a concert idea into a fortune. Okay, so that's about these guys. Okay, and this is what their jobs were. Joel was tasked with daily work. The concert had to be awake. All the deals were accomplished by themselves, and Joel still held home. The super objective. I was the guy who had to find the bands, get the helicopter, get the banker out of bed, collect into some cashier's checks, one after the rest of the other. So he drove through the crowd and was to pay for cash to the angry musicians, the Who. Roseman took a moment to take in the spectacle. We wanted to build it into another world, a shining place where you could go and feel that you weren't a misfit, that you were on the wrong side, that you were on the wrong side of a debate. that you weren't under, that you were on the wrong side of the date, that you weren't under the auspicious side of the floors. Okay. All right. Okay, and then there's a little bit about John Roberts. Now, John Roberts is the one that goes up when the thunderstorm came and said, you know, now we've just got a free mess on our hands. And he's looking some of that stuff. Let's see if I can trim down this paragraph just a little bit. It looks like it's just a little bit long about John Roberts, so I'll be right back. Okay, I'm going to trim this. We don't want one quotes after another, and I see that, but this does not need to be this long. I'm just going to delete that and go right here. Roberts held fast to the dream. That's got to stay. But I'm going to trim this stuff down. I'm just going to show you this one because it's. It, I, I want to show you how to really shorten a long paragraph. Okay, so I don't need this information from Lang. Uh, the whole point of this topic sentence, John Roberts drove into the venue along with other participants. That This is about John Roberts. I don't need anybody else to come in here. And even though, I mean, I overwrite, so that's okay. We Okay, that's him. Now, let's go and take this out. Langan Cornfield had a pie-in-the-sky dream, but if... Right back. You see how wordy this is? So, that was three long sentences, so... There we go. So I took those three sentences and I made it into one. Lang and Cornfield had a pie in the sky dream, but if ever there was a person for whom the tipping point of principles apply, it is John Roberts who allowed the vision to supersede his financial disaster. 
Robertson, this is the end of their little section. Robertson were not the sparkle and glitz of charming visionaries. They were the engine that made the festival happen. We don't need all that. Were. Robertson Rosen were the end of it. Remains as the connectors who kept an audience of half a meeple call. Okay. So that's a much better paragraph, isn't it? Not too short, not too long. It's just a nice little compact paragraph. And I just wanted to show you that one because when overwriting like that, I know that that's coming up and I want to make sure that I allow for that. All right. I'll be back. Okay, so I finished up little John's with that nice little picture of the pilgrimage. So that gives him a little image there. Okay, now the stage MCs are, in my opinion, and I have to prove that, prove my opinion, that they were the key to the whole thing. As a young teacher, I said, so I'm going to bring it back to me because... If I need an example, I just I can always just quote myself. As a young teacher, I sat in an auditorium of professional high school students. Assembly took place before lunch, so the collective group was crammed in together and hungry. An administrator walked on the stage and stood behind the podium, far side of the stage, ruler in hand. I've never understood the need for the ruler. The administrator said, young people, young people, sit down, and the administrator struck her palm with the ruler. I'll be brief. The students stormed the stage. Once in the event arena, a crowd the size of Woodstock could have turned on a dime. The MC is part storyteller, part technician, and part ringmaster. The four primary organizers were so busy putting out a million fires a day that they forgot to hire anyone to MC the event. Nobody at that time, nobody had the time to plan a, or schedule of announce uh, to plan had a time plan or schedule of announcements or focus group to carefully plan crowd control. Lighting director Chip Monk and talent wrangler John Morris were grabbed at the last minute, handed a microphone, and immediately connected to the audience. Again, I'm bringing that connecting in. I cannot imagine the challenges of keeping that many from charging the stage or panicking during a downpour. Chip Monk was known as the legend in lighting design. He was also active in the planning of the Denver Film Festival as well as Miami Pop. Denver Festival, just two months before Woodstock, for all of its wonderful acts and crowd support, was remembered only for this newspaper headline. Festival flop, 33 arrested and hurt. I may need to make that just a little bit bigger so my reader doesn't have to spend too much time. I think it's pretty, there's nothing else you can really see on it, so I'm, I'm going to be okay with that. Uh, Monk acted as crisis counselor at the festival at Woodstock, undue attention has been paid to the brown acid announcement. That always makes me nuts. I'm glad I put it in there. Of all the wonderful things that Monk did to calm a crowd, to speak the voice of God to a crowd of young teams, to help launch careers by announcing the acts as if they were superstars, this warning about a rumor circulating the crowd that bad drugs were, this rumor, that, okay, this rumor, let's just take this out this rumor that bad drugs were circulating did avoid a panic, but it is the tip of the iceberg of Monk's contribution. All right, that's enough said. I know it's a negative. I know it, but it just always has made me mad. Um, it's my essay, so. Additionally, Sayers comment that the crowd was easy to control because they were all on drugs. You know, that whole drug thing just can't be avoided. And uh, I think... I think it was something to overcome rather than something that made the thing calm. Uh, there is nothing worse than a person on drugs and a freak out. Consider for a moment the crowd at Altamont of a disastrous festival that took place just four months after Woodstock. The image at right shows the Woodstock crowd left in the middle of a thunderstorm. The opposite picture shows the crowd at Altamont on a perfectly lovely weather day. So obviously that picture is somewhere where it's not supposed to be. Shock, shock, there it is. I put this together myself. I had these pictures and I put them side by side to just to show because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. And so this is a picture of Chip. We'll move him. Go on down there, go on down there. Okay. This, okay, the image at right. Okay, we're at right. All right, can you see that? She's kind of hard to see, isn't she? 
Let's just make it just a wee bit because it's a compilation picture. I don't want my reader to have to squint and try to figure out what's going on in here. Okay, all right. Uh, the rumor of an inferior quality drug was one announcement on a list of a hundred times a day these MCs quieted a crowd, and these were by no means professional announcers. I'm going to be right back after I look over these. Okay, that's all him. We don't deviate from that. Nice short paragraph introducing him. Hopefully those words are powerful enough. And now we go into the other stage announcer, John Morris, and so we have a nice little transition sentence and... This is going to be the end of that announcer section throughout the concert. Helicopters brought in musicians, equipment, and doctors when Harmony Helicopters. This is a big, huge thing. This is one of my biggest points that I hold up against any naysayer or anybody that says, like, oh, they were drugged. When helicopters flew in, the crowd began to stir. In a world where the armed forces did not represent the friends of the counterculture, it was expected that concern would set in. In the documentary film by Michael Wadley, the depiction of the helicopters showed a crowd that looked up to see the military arrival. To my surprise, they did not then get up and start to race out. They looked to the stage. I might think that the natural response would be to cut bait and run. Instead, they looked to the stage. Morris took a microphone and said in a very calm voice, The U.S. Army has sent help. There are 45 doctors who are here because they dig what this is into. They are 45 doctors without pay. They are for us. And the crowd cheered for the Army. Not to put too fine a point on this, but those are 30 words that turn the tide of 600,000 potentially volatile people. That is called a connector. The security of, T of Woodstock completes the list of key connectors for the festival. Okay. Let's just zoom you back up here. All right. I'm going to look this paragraph over. I'll be right back. Okay, so this is, this is, I'm glad this scooted over so you can see that I can take this and move it back over where it's supposed to be. See that? That's just this little arrow. You probably already know this. Okay, so this is a new paragraph, and you can see that this is another one where we found a one that is way too long. So, this is first aid statement that suggested that they hire a gentleman named Hugh Romney. And now we're going to set up for that. Summers of Love, uh, set the context for that. Okay, just rush the gates. Okay, now this is a new paragraph. The producers of Woodstock went another way with security. You see that where we sort of set this up and we're going to be getting to this whole this is like one of the big points of the essay so we want to make sure that there's plenty of time to ease into that because if ever there was like what would you think the music the festival would draw well people who love music people who keep them under control you know and then you look at these people who were in charge of security okay the producers of Woodstock went another way with security. Just four months after Woodstock, they all went, do I want to go backwards? I guess I do, because I'm trying to set up the con the the contrast between these people and these people. So I guess we do. Again, if I was doing this for a master's thesis, my committee chairman would probably have something to say about it, but we'll just go with it, uh, just to set it up. Uh, to a more traditional start of the crowd. May I say that among my favorite my favorite memories of rock concert, Gate Crashers, is the one blemish on the events. I just put that in there. I don't know. I don't like it. I hate the fact. I hate it. I know what you're thinking. I know. I know. I know. I know. My opinion is like not germane to this paragraph. I know. I took it out. And his message was to connect with the audience in all final instances it would suck our zero were and you made an excellent Altadine Altamont security on the other hand created three deaths at least five stabbings gun violence and one murder 
It is a striking contrast that makes Wavy Gravy the last of the Woodstock connectors. Okay. All right. I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it. You know, I'm leaving it. Because these are not people you would ever expect to show up as a... Had these people been the New York Upstate Police Force, there wouldn't have been this... All this fall to raw that I'm making over it. Okay. Great movie. Lane disrupts the job interview. I saw her solo. Okay, I'm going to look this over and I'll be right back. I'm going to show you how I'm going to trim up one sentence uh, in his high school yearbook. And you can see how long this is, the citation is. So, and there we go. I'll be right back. I cut this, this part about Chris Langhart and Bill Hanley. They were the sound designers and the, um, and Chris was making everything happen. And I'm going to put a picture in right here. It's the picture of the bridge. Nobody, it's a great story and I'm not getting into it. So I'll just, I'll just pop in the picture. I know you're right. You're right. If you have a concert with no sound and you can't get a, the equipment or talent to the stage, I'm going to have to, I'm just going to write a little paragraph about the two guy, two of these guys. I'll be right back. Okay. You were right. I couldn't, I can't get out of this section without knowledge, acknowledging these two guys. And I didn't write a lot of words. I did the paragraph and they didn't get a lot of words, but they got some pretty pictures, which I think speak a thousand words. And this is interesting because, you know, they had 23 days to build this stage and then by Friday morning or Thursday night, this, the crowd was this and nobody could get to the, nobody could get down the highway. And so, this Chris Langhart built this little bridge from where the helicopters would drop people off so that the equipment and the performers could get to the stage. Isn't that brilliant? And so I put a little arrow, photoshopped a little arrow, otherwise my reader doesn't know what to see. And I kept the whole expanse of the picture because you can see that this is solving a very important problem. And then I gave a little nod to the sound guy. I couldn't find a big picture of the whole sound system, but this is at least one of the towers, and and this is right before the rainstorm is coming in, so it's amazing that all this stuff stayed, continued to work. Can you imagine? Okay, so now we're back, and we're going on to this uh, section that we have just done, which is about wavy gravy. What is this? What's your problem here? So I'm just coming almost to the end of this. Oh, I see. All right. All right. I like to check those out and just see what they're doing. Okay, that is that. We're coming right along. We're coming right along. And then this, this is what took so long. I want to give you this little tip just for fun of it. So this guy is the guy who was Wavy Gravy's right-hand man. And he was a construction guy. He built the stages back there. He built the stuff that was in the woods, the free kitchen, all that stuff. And then every day, he came before all these people and did yoga exercises. Now, I had to find his name. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's not listed in the credits for the film. It's I was just, oh, my gosh, how am I going to find this? And so I'm on YouTube, which includes the scene of him conducting yoga classes. And I scroll down to the comments and that's where people put his name. So that was something that I learned new from this project is that you can always find stuff more easily than I think. So now we move on to the stickiness factor. And I've already done this pretty much, but let's look through it together real quick. I know you're happy that I put in the sound guy and the, and the, um, and Chip did the lighting director, but I just, we just can't. It's going to turn into a 500-page essay if we don't. Okay, well, let's talk. Come and look this over. I'll be right back. 
I had originally put this poster thing in the beginning of the thing and then here and then at the end. So I took it out of the end and I left it here because when you look at the posters from all the festivals and they're quite fun and it was quite an interesting time and they're just all delightful. But one of the things that my point is, none of these contain a, a mission statement. It's all the people who are playing, which is fantastic, and they were very successful. But there were no other posters that were created with an absolute mission statement of this is what this festival attempts to accomplish, which is three days of peace and music. And, of course, nobody can agree about who came up with three days of peace and music. I don't care. I'm just saying that this is what made the poster stand out in addition to the fact that it's unique and it's just a really quite a brilliant Matisse inspired thing. And then I go through this about the vision statement. I mean, a purpose and how that plays out. Simple chart. I don't even need to draw an arrow on that. The reader is not going to have to take that much time to just see the radius of this. So that's, that's that. I'll be right back. This gap problem is just problematic. And when there's this little bit of a gap there, then I just go right up here to layout. And there's no, you see how that just took out that space when I went to zero there? All right, good. Be right back. So here we are in the stickiness factor, and I'm just going to show you this one paragraph that is way too long, as you can see. And so sometimes this is me, and sometimes this is when all the different things get added and so forth. So let's go, let me just let you look at this, and you tell me where the paragraph should be divided, just for fun. You're right, it's right here. That paragraph above was wrapping up the stickiness factor. And now we're talking about the facts and how the facts still don't explain the leap from 30,000 to 4 million. And I think I've made that clear in the, in the essay without driving that home. And now we move into the spirituality and the spirituality is divvied up into a couple of different, three different sections. Mystical intuition and insight. Okay. The only question about any of this is going to be whether or not we need images. Okay. This is way too long. See, the, one of the neat things about editing this way is that it's easy for me to see when a paragraph is too long and something happened there. So I just have to find out where that paragraph ends. Okay, so we can see that this paragraph ends with this transition sentence, which is me telling a little story about something that happened to me so I can relate to this. And this is how I avoid saying things like a lot of people, a ton of people, most people, or anything else. I just keep it to my own story. I save this all the time because I'm so worried that it's going to disappear. Um, so, this is that little story about that. It became a blessing. Okay, i got to fix all this gap stuff here, so I'll be right, you see all this, I'll be right back. In Word, when formatting goes cali-wampus like that, I can go up here. This is where I can see where the page breaks are by clicking this. But sometimes I just click this, which is going to take me back to a different font and everything else, but it makes it so easy to simply highlight, change to Times New Roman, 12, double space. See how that worked? I just highlighted the entire paragraph, clicked this, it put into a different font and everything, and I just changed that and look, now it's all, it's all good. And that was all because I put an image, or an image somehow got in the wrong place. 
Okay, I'll be right back. I'm in the deeper eye section of the mystic intuitive spirituality. I want to just point out one thing to you, and that is that part of the argument is that leading up to the fact that these kids should have starved to death or dehydrated to death. And so in this, uh, in the midst of this, these people who lived around the um, who lived around the venue site sent sandwiches and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm saying that prior to this, the townspeople were extremely hostile about this situation. And <clears throat> without going too much into detail with all of it, I just need to make the point that residents weren't waiting with open arms to welcome these hippies into their community, their quiet towns. And so what I'm making the point of, and I highlighted in yellow to just show you, the people of Sullivan County somehow received port reports of food shortages that gathered thousands of food donations to be airlifted to the site, including about 100 wicks sandwiches, water, fruit and canned goods, and that's from the Smithsonian report. This study does not contend. Now, this is where I need to bring in the opposition because I can't put a pink bow around all this and pretend that it was just a, a lovely little event and nothing ever happened and everybody was just all happy and kumbaya. So this is where I'm adding that little disclaimer. This study does not contend that all the residents of Sullivan County carried flowered memories of a kumbaya experience. Approximately 80 lawsuits were filed by farmers against Woodstock Ventures and were paid by proceeds from Wadley's Woodstock. Okay, so still, the fact remains that for a glittering moment in time, the residents came together with a shared united front to save the children from starvation. And, and I always do this, and it is. I add so many words, so when I edit, I'm connecting things in my brain. So when I edit, I take this stuff out. I'll be back. Right, so, uh, in fact, those 10,000 standard candidates were airlifted to this the site. Okay, so I'm breaking up, I'm going to break up this long paragraph. It doesn't need to be, well, I guess it's okay. Claims very important. The fact is that there's no way 10,000 sandwiches could possibly feed 600,000 teenagers. I'm making a biblical reference there, but rather than go too much into, you know, the biblical stories, I'm just saying one of my favorite movie lines is, science only goes so far, then comes God. I wish I'd written that line. It's from the notebook. And then we move on <clears throat> to the spirituality section. And I put in you. Mm, mm, mm. I'm making it too cutesy here. I'm starting, you know... Sometimes when I write, I start getting into storytelling and I get out of formal writing. That's why another reason why editing really helps. I'll be right back. Okay, this is the last point of the spiritual section. <clears throat> I'm just pointing out to you right here that if you, if we come to this, this point and this is at the bottom, just go ahead and scoot that to the next page. And I'm ending the conclusion with this picture that sort of correlates peaceful ruins with the ruins of Vietnam. And then I, where I'm going to wrap this back up to the <clears throat> dedication that I put on the title page, I've written this. And the, you know, about the now it's, this is messed up, so I got to fix this and then I'm done. I know you thought that quote was dumb. I did too. I thought it's way too lofty. So I just did the lyrics from Woodstock. Okay, that concludes this tutorial. It's now time to do the final draft. <laughs>